Okay, so the sample has finished exposing. Uh, so we can now close the, uh, the interface here and we can eject the sample. Go here, eject load and eject. And as before, we need to wait for it to eject. This again can take uh, half a minute to a minute depending on how the machine is, is doing. And then the following step after this will be to take it out to the folder. So we will undo the screws as we've done before. And then we will move on to the post-exposure bake step. And this is now ready, it's coming out. Remember that the film is on the bottom side, so it's facing the floor, so we need to flip it over. So I'm going to undo the screws first. Okay, I have to lift the cover. And we flip it over and with the film facing up now, we put it on a hot plate at 65 degrees for one minute. And then after this one minute, we will turn up the temperature to 95 and leave it to bake for another four minutes. And this is the so-called post-exposure bake step and it's a very important uh, step to activate the chemical reaction that uh, um, will make the uh, exposed part of the photoresist permanent uh, permanently attached to the sample. The sample has now been baking for about three minutes. In the meantime, we'll prepare the chemicals for the development. We're gonna need two chemicals. One is the so-called PGMEA. It's got this long chemical name. Um, and we're gonna fill a Petri dish of the, an appropriate size, so roughly halfway up with PGMEA. You want to put enough PGMEA to comfortably be able to cover the whole sample with the liquid. And then in the second uh, half of the Petri dish, I'm going to put uh, isopropanol. And the isopropanol is used to interrupt the development. So the PGMEA will do the actual development and it will, will remove the unexposed SU8 and then we will transfer the sample into the isopropanol to stop the development in its tracks and check that we have developed correctly. So I'm now going to take the sample off the hot plate. Again it can be a little bit sticky. And I'm going to leave it to cool down for about one minute. I'm going to start the timer for that. So leave it to cool down until it reaches room temperature and then the next step will be to take the sample, immerse it into the PGMEA um, and wait for a certain amount of time. And this amount of time depends on the type of photoresist that you're using and primarily it depends on the thickness. So you have to check the data sheet uh, or the protocol that you have uh, for the specific photoresist that you're using and for the thickness uh, that you've spun it at and this will give you a an indication of the time that you need. The exact amount of time is always depending on, on the user because uh, while you do the process, you, uh, while you emerge, immerse the, um, the sample in the PGMEA, you will need to gently shake it inside the Petri dish. And the level of agitation that you use uh, just with your fingers or with your tweezers or with the Petri dish itself uh, will determine exactly how much time um, uh, the PGMEA takes to, uh, to develop the SU8. So, uh, that will depend basically um, on a personal factor which you'll just have to get used to. Okay, so that sample is now cool. I'm going to turn on the light so you can see what I'm doing. I will now pick up the sample, keep a timer handy, 
and I'm aiming for this particular structure. Actually, um, in this particular stage of uh, after the post-exposure bake, you can already see uh, the structures. You should be able to see the structures of the maybe I'm not sure if you can see it on the camera maybe not maybe yes doesn't really matter but at this point after the post exposure bake you can see the contrast between um, you can see the contrast between the exposed and unexposed parts of the sample so there will be contrast on the edge but the film is all still there so uh, the, there is no um, there are no structural features yet on the sample itself so I'm going to keep a timer ready. So for the SUA 2010, uh, with the way that I agitate the sample inside the Petri dish, I'm expecting a development time of about 1 minute 30 to 2 minutes. So I'm going to deliberately underdevelop um, the sample so you can see uh, what is the effect of underdevelopment. Okay? So I'm going to get ready with my timer and immerse it in and start the timer as well. So I'm now starting the timer and all you want to do is gently shake your sample. I tend to keep a loose grip on the sample just with the tweezers, like so, to avoid dropping the sample inside the Petri dish and then it can be a little bit difficult to, to pick it back up uh, with the tweezers. So I try to do that. And I'm expecting that a minute 30 to two minutes is the right amount of development, but I'm going to extract it at around one minute and go straight into the isopropanol and I will show you what it looks like uh, when the sample is underdeveloped. If you have a bigger uh, wafer you can immerse it completely and then actually shake the petri dish instead of shaking the wafer itself which might be a little bit more convenient. It's important you keep a good flow and now we get to a minute, I'm going to stay straight out and into the isopropanol. And you can see these white uh, things that have been generated essentially by this partially developed SU8. So uh, this is what an underdeveloped um, SU8 pattern looks like. So this is not a problem, we can develop again and in fact we will do that next. So one, if this happens, um, you know that you have underdeveloped. So all you want to do is reset the timer and decide in advance again how long you want to keep developing for. So I'm going to go for another 40 seconds and then we'll see what the result is. Okay, so I'm going to keep my timer ready, get it out and back into the PGMEA. You will see the white clouds disappear over time, but this doesn't mean that the development is, is done uh, still. So if I were to put this right into the IPA right now, it would probably still uh, generate these white clouds. If you immerse it in the isopropanol um, and you don't see the white, it means that you either correctly developed or overdeveloped, which is not really usually a big risk. Okay, we've got about 40 seconds now, so I'm going to take it out, straight out and into the isopropanol. And this time I can see that the sample is completely clear, so there is no residue of um, partially developed SUA. So I'm going to pick up a isopropanol bottle and I'm going to get ready to uh, rinse off the excess of isopropanol and uh, blow dry. So I take it out. The structure should at this point be robust. Um, because the SU8 is, is quite a strong, um, has got a, quite a strong adhesion, but I usually tend to avoid um, squirting isopropanol directly at the structures, but rather let it trickle down over the structures by um, by sending the isopropanol near the edge. So I'm going to put it now on the piece of paper and blow it dry. And this is the development done. So I can now lift it up, I can let the IPA on the back uh, evaporate and I can check if the structures are here. I'm not sure that you will be able to see it uh, with the contrast of the camera, but you can see that there are some structures, uh, definitely, just over there. 
So this is now uh, done in terms of the development and we have the final baking step which is the so-called hard bake and we're going to put it at 200 degrees on a hot plate at 200 degrees for about 10 minutes. So the exact timing of the hard bake is not really critical but it's just a final uh, baking step which makes sure that the structure is completely permanent, permanently attached to the substrate and it will also be stable throughout any uh, uh, type of processing afterwards. And this completes therefore the, 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 this part of the fabrication, so we have the pattern on the sample. At this point, um, there's not much, if, if there's something wrong with the sample, and you can look at the sample now with a microscope or with a profilometer, but if there's something wrong with the sample at this point, there's not much you can do. So um, a lot of the time uh, there will be small defects, maybe small dust particles that have ended up somewhere uh, around the channels, which may not actually be a problem in making the microfilling device work, but if you see big defects, then at this point, you will just have to throw away the sample and make a new one.